It's not a new story. I have to say, none of this knowledge is new. We're adding to it all the time. But what always strikes me is that no matter how much we know, no matter how much we say, there's some critical link missing. And that's why I've, I've given my talk the slightly peculiar uh, title of Imagine Life Without Plankton. The story that I want to tell is how we are all connected, how all life is connected. And it's a wonderfully ephemeral thing to say, but it's very, very different if you can think of one thing and how it connects all life. So, one plankton. And I want you to try and make those links as we go through. So, South Africa, which is somewhere in the world, although not in this particularly um, North American-centered globe that I've got here, South Africa is an incredible country, and it's incredible for a whole variety of different reasons. But what I find most amazing about it, and it, it's not a coincidence perhaps that I did marine biology at UCT, and I can't claim to be unbiased about this, but what I find most amazing is our coast, our marine realm, the ocean that surrounds us. And um, in 2008, I started filming Shoreline, which is a documentary series of the South African coast. And we travel from the Namibian border to the Mozambican border. Uh, we've now done it a couple of times. And in our own words, it was an epic journey of discovery, which we proclaimed loudly and frequently. Um, you'll see some of the things we discovered. But what I really discovered along that journey is the wonder, a world of wonder, and sharing that wonder. And also talking to people and seeing how people were involved with the coast and how actually everything was so interconnected you couldn't draw a line anyway and say this happens there and means nothing to anyone else. But what I'm also very aware of is that the majority of people in South Africa would not agree with me. And that's probably for a number of reasons. I've picked two major ones and that is unusually for a coastal country the majority of South Africa's population is inland. So, already, there's a level of disconnectedness. And then, there's the fact that, frankly, who has got the luxury to worry about the environment when there are so many more pressing human issues at stake? So, let's think about the average life of a South African, a landlocked South African. What are they worried about? They're worried about food security, about uh, providing food for the day, educating their families, shelter, you know, finding a job. These things are real, tangible concerns. And let's then think about our political history and situation, which we just can't get away from. You know, it's the reason a lot of things are this way. We've got the majority of our population being excluded from access to the sea, information about the sea, education, resources, even those who were traditionally linked to the coast and to coastal use, excluded. And then you get this complete lack of understanding of the value of biodiversity for itself and as a resource. And you get no support for long-term planning, and you get no realization about the finite nature of those resources and what we use them. And it's all set in a country and a world where the focus is on social issues, the economy, justifiably, but with no realization of the role the environment plays in it. So now we have set in this kind of context of this um, complete inequality of, of you know, financial issues. You, you've got this um, anger, you've got this political history, you've got this absolute dichotomy of the educated, the non-educated, everything sitting like this. Let's throw in marine conservation and conservationists. South Africa is actually quite advanced in its marine conservation. We're quite a world leader. And that's largely to do with our network of marine protected areas. But marine protected areas were often proclaimed in such a way and in such a political regime, plus proclaimed in this context where 
there isn't an understanding of the ecological processes or the reasons for them. And so surrounding marine protected areas is this real negative perception and there's a complete inability to comprehend their value. And this is the community living right there and actually using the resources that those marine protected areas are, are there to protect. Now, can you imagine how little relevance they have for people who don't have any perceived connection to the ocean? Throw into that the uh, admittedly often protectionist view of conservationists and the fact that they themselves have got no idea how little connection and frankly how little interest the majority of people have in the oceans. Okay, but I want to now take a little step back to the sea itself. So, so let's look at the ocean because I keep kind of talking about it. The ocean is, well, it's vast, right? And it's globally connected. It has no borders. It's one ecosystem. But at the same time, it contains so many ecosystems within it. It almost has no limits. The ocean is where life began. So life began there, I, I think it's around three to three and a half billion years ago. Life began on land only 400 million years ago. Okay? It's been around in the ocean much longer. And yet we know less about the floor of the ocean than we do about the surface of the moon. The ocean, it provides us with benefits that often we don't see. So it's, a, it's like a vast highway for commerce. It's a place of recreation. It covers about 70% of the planet's surface, but 97% of all water on Earth is in the oceans. The top 10 meters of the ocean holds at least as much as, and probably more heat, than the entire atmosphere. We think that more than 80% of all life on Earth is found in the ocean. And it's something like 99% of the living space on the planet is in that ocean. The deepest point on, on the planet is also there, obviously, and that's 11 kilometers deep in the Challenger Deep uh, Trench. We probably have explored only 10% of this environment, and yet the direct resources we get out of it, the fisheries, 85% of them are either fully uh, or over-exploited. So the bits we do know about, we're not exactly doing a great job for. It's quite a, it's quite a difficult thing to comprehend at, as one big thing. It's quite ephemeral, and, and I think it leads and adds to that disconnectedness. You say, the ocean this, the sea that. So that's what I wanted to really do, is build, bring it to that most basic building block. What is the one tiny thing, the one thing which almost no life on the planet, and certainly no life in the ocean, could exist without? And the answer is plankton. So plankton are just amazing. They are tiny and they are huge. They go from microscopic to macroscopic. Uh, you get algae, plants, um, you get animals, you get jellies, predators and prey. You get the most extraordinary diversity in one of just the most amazing systems you get um, plankton that produce light. They're the most amazing system, and it's the biggest system we have. And plankton forms the basis of the oceanic food webs and food systems. Without plankton, there would be no life, with the possible exception of hydrothermal vents. Okay? Every other life form in the ocean depends on, pla on plankton. Plankton also are often photosynthetic. So the algae, which means that they sequester carbon. They take in the carbon that we're producing and they produce oxygen. Okay, we think somewhere between 50 and 80% of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from marine plankton. And they're not just the fuel for these uh, ocean ecosystems. They are quite literally the fuel for our carbon-based economy. Plankton blooms from millions and millions of years ago are the fossil fuels on which we have built our industrialized nation. There's not just um, 
what plankton do for the ocean though. If we now have a look a little bit at what the ocean does for weather, for the environment, for climate systems, okay? the ocean is the great moderator. The ocean is the reason that our climate and our weather and our environment looks like it does. Okay? The ocean holds all that heat. I said it held at least as much heat as the atmosphere. It holds that heat from the sun. And the great processes, the currents, the circulations, they move that heat around the planet. And by doing so, they really moderate it. If, if, they, if they didn't exist, if they didn't work like that, then we'd have these extreme frosty deserts and these harsh, hot areas, and we would have no areas that were habitable for us. And the oceans are taking in all the carbon we're producing. So what they're actually acting as, they're, they're buffering the effect, the potentially catastrophic effects of our own self-induced climate change. The oceans are giving us this false sense of resilience. But it's only up to a certain point, okay? There's a threshold for that, a tipping point, and it is going to be reached soon. And what we need to emphasize is everything that we do, the air we breathe, the crops we grow, the rainfall we get, Painful. It all comes from the ocean, and the ocean systems need to function for that to happen. And if they need to function, that's because plankton. The plankton is healthy, the plankton is blooming. That system is the beginning of it all. So it goes back to something that everyone is worried about, food security, right? It's a real issue. And if you look at something that I'm sure all of you have heard of, El Nino. Yeah, El Nino is a change in the circulation patterns in the Pacific. And sure, it causes an immediate effect in, in terms of affecting the fishing, but I'm not just talking about fishing because El Nino, what it then does is it changes the rainfall patterns over the entire southern hemisphere, which affects people growing staple food sources and crops right in the center of the continent. We all depend on the oceans all the time. This is a photo taken last week or the week before, and this one in Strand, okay, just up the road. The moderating effects of the ocean perhaps not working quite as well as they could. So what I really want to do is now go back quickly to that landlocked South African, let's say they're in rural free state, worried about jobs, worried about food security, worried about education, worried about basic concerns. I, I cannot imagine that they would think marine conservation is a priority, and I, I would understand that. In fact, they probably think marine conservation shouldn't be on anyone's priority list, but social issues, you know, what, what humans need to survive our society, yes, that is important, and yes, that is where we need to focus. But we need to understand that underpinning that all is the assumption that there is a functioning ecosystem. So I'm not asking for people to neglect the um, social issues or, or relegate them in favor of rah-rah the environment, okay? And I'm also not saying that um, people should you know, neglect those things, um, neglect the, the uh, environment in, in terms of social issues. It just doesn't work that way. And what I'm definitely not looking for is what came out of COP17, because frankly, the only thing I can make out is that we agreed that in the future, we would discuss something to potentially agree on something that wouldn't change anything before 2020, except possibly what we had agreed to discuss in the future, which was just kind of what I had got out of it. But what I really want to start happening is for people to, to understand that there is only one planet and we depend on it. We really do depend on that. And that environmental issues shouldn't be something that is trotted out to gain votes or squashed to gain votes, whichever way it may work. And that our lives, all our lives, our future lives, whether we are in my case, a marine biologist from Komaki, or a politician canvassing for votes in Mpumalanga, or a, a mine worker potentially in the Nkongala grasslands, or that landlocked South African in the rural free state. Yeah. All our lives depend on the functioning of the environment. All our social issues in our society is underpinned by the functioning ocean ecosystem, and ultimately by plankton. So I cannot, personally, I cannot imagine life without plankton and the oceanic uh, systems that it's an integral part of. But my wish and what I really would like to see is that eventually 
Nobody on earth can imagine it either. Thank you. Thank you.